let's um, start the discussion. Uh, the topic is uh, QCD phase diagram in astrophysics. I decided to prepare a few slides to uh, uh, power the discussion, to give some inputs. And uh, then after this short introduction, I will um, ask uh, the speakers of the main session whether they also want to inject some topics. And uh, after that, we will open the discussion to everybody. I, I'm sure there are many questions to this very hot topic. So first of all, uh, we did not succeed to get all the speakers which we wanted to have. Uh, we wanted to have a presentation, for instance, of um, the role, possible role of uh, phase transition in uh, supernova explosions as it is um, uh, indicated here in this uh, phase diagram, which is a three-dimensional phase diagram from the NUPAC long range plan. And uh, many of us uh, know it because here you see not only uh, the region and the temperature chemical potential plane, which um, is uh, accessible to heavy ion collision experiments and to lattice QCD studies and the uh, infamous uh, critical endpoint, but also uh, the isospin axis, which is important for astrophysics. And then down in the t equals zero plane, you see the neutron stars. And then um, this red banana is, um, stands for regions which can be explored with supernova and neutron star mergers. And that's our business. And um, this banana region can possibly pierce into through this igloo-shaped rosa region into um, the quark matter phase. Of course, we do not know exactly. Therefore, we make the heavy ion collision experiments of the next kind, like uh, at Nika and at FAIR or low energy RIC. But um, uh, let us uh, see uh, what um, present uh, state-of-the-art uh, supernova calculation could um, tell here. And there is one work which I would like to uh, draw your attention to um, by uh, Tobias Fischer and uh, collaborators. It appeared in Nature Astronomy recently. And actually the claim and uh, the demonstration of this paper is that a phase transition could uh, trigger or could play the role of an engine that um, explodes uh, supernovas, which emerge from um, massive, highly massive blue supergiants, uh, progenitor stars of 50 solar masses. And as to best of my knowledge, there is no alternative uh, mechanism which could explode uh, stars in that mass range. Okay, so, and here is the phase, the QCD phase diagram. So the section of the QCD phase diagram from that paper. It highlights a hadron quark mixed phase and um, it shows uh, two trajectories of um, uh, 50 solar mass uh, star. Uh, actually what the, the central fluid element uh, would travel in the temperature density plane. So the red dashed curve would be in the pass without a phase transition. Here, uh, after collapse, so the star goes denser and denser and finally ends up in a black hole. However, uh, when we consider an equation of state with uh, sufficiently early uh, quark hadron phase transition, then the trajectory of um, which is governed by constant entropy per baryon is uh, taking a different path and uh, actually uh, leads to the formation of a proton neutron star core with a sufficiently high density and uh, with uh, so in the interior of this um, uh, configuration, uh, there's a high density phase on which infalling matter can be shocked and lead to an explosion. So this is a successful explosion simulation, which uh, for such an equation of state is shown here. So you see how the proton neutron star radius evolves this time and um, at a time of about 1.2 um, seconds after bounce, um, there is an explosion that is ignited, a second shock, which leads to a full explosion of this supernova. And here you see the radius of the object which extends uh, beyond 
10,000 uh, kilometers. Okay, this is good news. And these studies are presently uh, continued because one wants to know uh, how general is this property. So what is the dependence of the explodability of um, stars, depending on the progenitor stars, but also on um, the precise shape of the equation of state and the phase diagram. Even is this three-dimensional phase diagram, which I showed in the beginning. The second news uh, we heard already uh, today um, came from the mergers. So there were two interesting merger talks. And here I will highlight uh, some systematic studies which have been performed by uh, Blacker and Bauswein and others. And um, they investigate the dependence on the details of a phase transition uh, for the signal, which is uh, observable when one plots the post-merger peak frequency against uh, the pre-merger from the in-spiral phase tidal deformability, which is somehow a measure of the size of the, uh, of the object. And then we see here this uh, significant deviation. Um, here, these were equations of state where the onset uh, was beyond the uh, actual mass of the merging stars. But um, there was a study which will appear now in EPJ, EPJST journal by Andreas Bauswein and uh, Sebastian Blacker, where they studied also uh, very early onsets, uh, as we have heard from David Alvarez, they might, that such a scenario might be very interesting even with some possibility of mass twins here at the onset, which is slightly below one solar mass. So in that case, the merging stars are already hybrid stars. And also in this case, there is some uh, significant deviation from the hadronic um, systematics. Well, uh, the point which I would like to inject to the discussion is about the nature of the transition and how to also properly define the nature of the transition. So we, when we come from heavy ion collisions and we are searching um, for the critical endpoint, which is expected somewhere here in the middle of the uh, temperature baryochemical potential plane. Uh, but when we are at very low temperature, then uh, um, some of our colleagues, which I name here, have uh, studied what could happen when we consider color superconducting conducting quark matter phases. And there is the issue of the so-called quark hadron continuity. And uh, this could mean that uh, there is a crossover transition down here. So this would mean that there is a second critical endpoint in the phase diagram, or eventually there's actually no uh, critical endpoint at all in the phase diagram, but rather we have a more or less um, sharp crossover all over in the phase diagram. So, and David, sorry to interrupt, but could you make your uh, router like full screen view? Because no way. I could um, uh, try that. Let's try this. Is it better? Thanks. Thanks. It's much better now. Okay. Uh, wait, and let me. Wait a little bit. Okay. Yeah, so we were discussing the possibility of having a continuous transition at low temperatures for neutron stars and eventually also for up to those temperatures which we probe with mergers and uh, supernova explosions. So once there is um, such a possibility of a continuous transition, so of a crossover transition, so what are possible uh, theoretical backgrounds? So one of them is um, what I mentioned here is color superconductivity. There is, um, let's see, how can I, uh -huh. there's another one uh, is inhomogeneous chiral condensates. So discussed, uh, very much in recent papers by Michael Bobala and Stefano Carignano. And uh, if so, then we have here in uh, note, this is chemical potential, not density. 
And we have here this um, uh, region uh, with inhomogeneous chiral condensates. Eventually, the, the um, consequence would also be inhomogeneous um, color superconducting islands, um, which, to the best of my knowledge, has not yet been fully studied. And this would not be a critical endpoint, but would be rather as a pseudo Lifshitz point. Okay, so let's see. Uh, what also we have heard in, a, in the talk by Konstantin Maslov is um, that for, in particular, for a strong first order transition, there is um, the, um, there is the possibility and, uh, and that uh, a strong first order phase transition uh, forms structures. And when it forms structures, then we have pasta phases. And here we have seen these uh, uh, simulations of uh, the past, the different pasta structures and how they can effectively be described with some interpolating construction. And actually this uh, paper, uh, which appeared um, the past year, gives a rather universal formula, at least we hope that it is uh, universal. It should be tested by different uh, uh, hadronic and quark matter equations of state as an input. And this formula can uh, give you all these, uh, can reproduce you this um, pasta phase uh, uh, constructions without making an actual pasta, uh, pasta phase um, calculation, just by dialing the uh, proper uh, surface tension and by inputting a Maxwell construction and a Glendon construction. Okay, so uh, another possibility which um, uh, was not presented here, but which is uh, published in several already publications by Michael Marchenko as the first author, but there are also alternative ideas. It's about the parity doubling uh, realization of chiral symmetry uh, restoration, uh, which is then a chirally symmetric hadronic phase where uh, just uh, the chiral partners in particular for the for our interest in astrophysics, these are uh, the chiral partners of the nucleon. They can degenerate in mass, and then we have uh, a change in the effective number of degrees of freedom. And this goes along with the phase transition, which can even be first order, with a rather lowish critical endpoint here of the same order as the liquid gas uh, phase transition critical endpoint, which is of the order of between 10 and 20. MeV, but it can also be absent. And then we have another crossover inside uh, the hadronic phase. Uh, notably, uh, such a scenario also fulfills the known constraints um, from the tidal deformability and from the maximum mass of neutron stars. And yeah, finally, we want to understand this all and um, have an approach which can um, predict so an effective model which can predict whether there is a critical endpoint, where is the critical endpoint, or eventually that there is only crossover all over. And uh, one of the approaches which um, gives this is an um, attempt at a unification of a, a quark hadron meta model on the basis of a bit Uhlenbeck equation of state, um, which then uh, defines a density functional and so one obtains a behavior of chemical potential versus baryon density with such a double van der Waals wiggle, which corresponds to two first order transitions, which in this simplistic uh, parametrization, which just for exploratory reasons has, has been kept very simple in this uh, archive paper, uh, has uh, a very is large uh, proximity of the liquid gas transition and the uh, deconfinement transition. Uh, it has also uh, quite a, a sensible dependence on a screening parameter in this model, which could uh, transform this to a, a scenario with a crossover all over. So the green dashed line here is crossover all over. Okay, and then uh, if you ask for any signatures, of course it de would depend on how sharp 
the crossovers. And this is maybe a point which we may discuss in our discussion. So here I uh, remind of the picture which we have seen already. So if we have from astrophysics down here at low temperatures, indications for a strong phase transition where a large latent heat is involved. So this should be the proper definition of uh, first order. So if there's latent heat involved, it uh, might be even with uh, pasta phases, it's also first order. Then uh, there's a good argument that there should be a critical endpoint somewhere in the phase diagram because on the temperature axis, we know that the transition is a crossover. And so here's another version of this, which was provided by Akira Onishi, but uh, the same physics, the three-dimensional phase diagram has possibility of a critical endpoint, which vanishes as a function of uh, temperature and as a function of the asymmetry in astrophysics. Okay, and with this, I uh, then would like to pose the question here. The main goal of our theoretical studies is to develop a theory for the nature of the phase transition, which shall be explored in astrophysics as well as in heavy ion collisions. And um, uh, we have limits which are quite well explored. This is a statistical model of hadron resonance gases. Uh, on the one hand, the perturbative QCD, which we have heard in the first talk uh, up here, and uh, the notorious questions and how to join these two asymptotics and uh, ideas which our group in Wolfsburg and also in Dubna has injected is to consider the mod dissociation of hadrons coming from uh, hadron resonance gas on the one hand and having effective models for deconfinement and for the reappearance of quark and gluon degrees of freedom when we deconfine the, the matter. Now, uh, let me make prepare already the transition to the discussion session. So here are the two uh, scenarios which I would like to contrast. We heard in the first talk uh, by Alexei uh, Burin and also yesterday by Alexei Kokela, um, uh, the analysis of the pressure energy density plane, where here was a region down reminding um, where the transition on the finer temperature axis is in, in lattice QCD. And <clears throat> just by a, the simplest extrapolation here of nuclear matter equation of state on the one hand, and uh, down extrapolation of the perturbative QCD, one can uh, predict across, um, a crossing of these uh, two systematics and would expect a, a transition somewhere here. However, one should maybe have a bit closer look. Then when we come down from perturbative QCD, we should expect the onset of uh, non-perturbative effects of confinement at some point. And here I have sketched what would, for instance, be the effect in the simplest case of a bag model. It uh, gives them such a behavior of uh, the effective uh, quark matter model going down here. And on the other hand, uh, coming from the nuclear matter case, when um, we increase the nuclear matter density beyond the saturation point, then at some point, nuclei, nucleons uh, start overlapping and the Pauli blocking by their quark constituents should lead to a stiffening of the nuclear matter. And that is indicated here by this uh, turning up and then a phase transition, a strong phase transition could result with these two ingredients, confining effects on the quark matter side and uh, stiffening effects on the hadronic matter side. Where exactly the phase transition is, it, there is room here in this um, uh, area between the two asymptotic limits. And uh, these actually are the orders of magnitude for the transition, the transition pressure below 100 MeV per Fermi cube, maybe as low as 10 or 20 MeV per Fermi cube, uh, could uh, actually induce a very early phase transition and um, uh, twin stars. This is the Dov criterion for the neutron star instability. And we have seen in the talk by um, David Alvarez uh, some of the consequences. 
one of the predictions would be uh, that high mass, uh, yeah, high mass neutron stars in the region of two solar masses should have rather low radii and uh, maybe below 12 kilometer would then prove the existence of quarks matter in the core. Why? Because there's uh, no realistic hadronic equation of state which would uh, provide a two solar mass neutron star with smaller radii. Well, this I leave here as a provocative statement for you. And now um, here is a slide which um, Alexi has uh, provided and I would invite him also to inject his ideas to the discussion. And then we start the open discussion. Okay, Alexi, please. Yeah, thank you very much. So uh, if I had to somehow condense the message of, of this nature physics paper that I talked about earlier today to, to a very short statement, it would basically be the following. No, no the slide vanished. Yeah, great, thanks. So uh, of course the best scenario for discovering quark matter inside neutron stars would, would be the observing of a smoking gun signal. And maybe this will one day be, be possible for instance by through the gravitational wave measurements of of, uh, of a neutron star merger, and it is especially the later stages of it. But in the meantime, when we don't don't have such a such a smoking gun observation, the next best thing that I can think of is is that we keep working hard on constraining the neutron star matter equation of state, both by doing theoretical computations at, at low and and high densities and on the, on the other hand then then using uh, all observations that we have available and and uh, of course in over time also the accuracy of the different types of observations both from from radius and mass measurements and and from gravitational wave measurements will hopefully hopefully improve now where we are today is that uh, what what we showed in this paper is that uh, the fact that that in inside in the centers of maximally massive neutron stars matter behaves like quark matter more or less that that is guaranteed unless simultaneously the uh, speed of sound in nuclear matter reaches very high values and the phase transition between nuclear matter and quark matter is is strongly first order and if, if uh, these two conditions are not fulfilled, then we automatically obtain uh, sort of qualities for, for uh, the material properties of neutron star matter inside maximally massive stars that are quite close to quark matter. And uh, could you, David, maybe uh, put the slide back there? Because there were two questions that I wanted to, wanted to finish with that would, would maybe serve as a thanks a lot serve as, as sort of discussion points for for us all. So uh, one of these is, is that as we all all probably know somehow the standard law in nuclear theory uh, has suggested for a long time that that indeed very high speeds of sound should at some point at some densities be obtained and, and the phase transition would be a strongly first order one. But I, I would kind of like to challenge this. Why is this statement or this expectation really robust? Why do we think this is so? And, and then the second question that if indeed it, it turned out that uh, the way to maybe observe quark matter in the end was through these kinds of, of uh, constraint or this kind of constraining of the material properties of, uh, of neutron star matter. So, so how would you define quark matter? What, what does quark matter mean to you? So we, as you know, we, we use this uh, polytropic index gamma as, as the criterion, but there are many other quantities that, that uh, one, one might in principle use. And, and this is really a genuine question to everybody that what, what do you think, uh, how, how should we actually uh, define quark matter if we had access to, to the material properties, to, to the equation of state and related quantities, but we did not have an observation, a direct observation of a, of a phase transition in between nuclear matter and quark matter. Thanks a lot.
David, so maybe, uh, 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 David do you hear? David? Maybe, maybe he lost his connection. Oh, no, no okay, sorry. Ah, okay. <laughs> I, I muted myself. I'm, I'm sorry, I pressed the wrong button. So, okay. So then I wanted to suggest if there, maybe we can st start the discussion directly after having raised these questions uh, and then go on with other uh, speakers. So, first to this point. Okay, but maybe otherwise, let, let's go through all speakers. Uh, and uh, so uh, by their order, so Matthias Hanauske and then Andy Bauswein, maybe they also bring up the ideas and uh, the audience can uh, uh, think about uh, urgent uh, questions or other ideas for the discussion. Yeah, so um, while well, um, I want to say something maybe later about uh, this um, unknown object of the third gravitational wave event, uh, which might be a neutron star, but maybe it would be good to first uh, go into the questions, if, if there are still some open questions. Yeah, okay, then um, is Andy Bauswein still around? So, uh, but... There was a question, I think so. Andy, so? Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm around, but I think there was some question by somebody. Somebody started to speak. Yeah, Kostya, you wanted to say something. Right? Uh, yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, may I? Yeah, please then. Since you made me a co-host, I can't raise a hand. Yeah, since I'm a co-host. Yeah, well, uh, I would like to comment a little bit on this uh, provocative question of the last slide of David, uh, related to David Alvarez's talk. So uh, may I just uh, sh share my screen too? I'd like to do that. And... Uh, David, please, could you stop yeah, sharing then? Do you mind, David? Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Oh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. So, can you see, uh, there, there should be two figures. One of them, actually, the mass radius uh, relation for some models which are good with uh, the constraints we have from nuclear physics uh, and the maximum neutron star mass and two solar mass stars been well around the uh, 11 kilometers uh, with no quark cores. So uh, uh, answering the this uh, proposition by David Alvarez, uh, here is uh, just a counterexample. So, uh, and uh, if you allow for, well, more hyperons inside. Sorry, let me comment. So the statement was, uh, that's it. Uh, yeah. Sorry that I interrupted. Yeah. Do not uh, be mistaken here. So the statement yeah, yeah. Sure. Um, at the sure, mass sure. at the mass of two solar masses, so what is the actual radius of your suggested model? Uh, of two solar masses, it's uh, yeah. like uh, slightly less than twelve, like between uh, eleven and twelve with ease. Well, uh, if, if I look at your at your plot here, it's slightly above. So maybe you should really uh, check numerically. So the statement which uh, which I made and we made was 11.9 kilometers was a limit. And for, let's say now, not for an effective model, but for a model based on uh, hadronic inputs like, uh, like the APR, so based on nucleon, nucleon and uh, many nucleon forces. Uh, the, this citation is this Yamamoto, Raiken, and Kogashi, and so on. And first, let's see. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. uh, but, but it's interesting, uh, it's interesting that you are. Uh, are the hadronic species? This is. So, uh, hadronic may, is. May I just make a little, little comment on this figure? <laughs> 
Yeah, since uh, we use some suppression mechanism for for hyperons, right? So the maximum point is with the most uh, suppressed hyperons. Lower, we have least suppressed hyperons, but we can get uh, lower, lower, lower. So we can make a maximum neutron star mass, say, uh, slightly above the limit when we, we have. And then this line would go, uh, would pass the two solar mass limits at uh, 11 point, I don't know, three, five, something like that. So um, in my point of view, when we talk about this uh, transition to quarks, we should, shouldn't forget about hyperons actually, and maybe some other <laughs> hadronic species. And uh, the left figure is actually for the similar set of models, uh, the speed of sound squared. So related to, to Alexis' talk today. So uh, may, maybe could you tell, uh, is it a hadronic model or quark model up to this high, high density limit? I don't know. So uh, I mean, this, uh, this uh, statement, uh, which was at the last slide, that hydronic models mean uh, large speed of sound and, uh, and uh, uh, strong phase transition, well, maybe may may be softened uh, this uh, statement just by consideration of more baryonic species. Uh, so, okay, very, so this was a question to Alexei, actually. And you show on the left graph, you show this blue line, and the yeah, blue yeah. line on the right-hand side is the one which uh, reaches well above uh, two solar masses, and this is a model without quarks, but it's an effective model, right? So, uh, no, uh, hmm? uh, let me, uh, no, 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 the mass figure does not correspond so far. Uh, let me open the corresponding one. So uh, that figure was uh, slightly nicer, but uh, there should be another one. Yeah, here it goes. Yeah, so uh, uh, at least for the blue line, we definitely go uh, beyond two solar masses. So, uh, but for the blue line, we also have uh, low speed of sound at high densities. So now I cannot. So this is see this. maybe an example of a different behavior in hydronic models. So what what is now the radius at two solar mass of this blue one? The radius at two is uh, let me see twelve point five is here. Okay. So uh, slightly uh, yeah. yeah maybe twelve. Mm -hmm. Oh. At, at two solar masses, so it's uh, above, it's two point. Two yeah, 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 so uh, mm -hmm. yeah, 12 point something. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, uh, yeah, so, Alexei, you want to comment to this? So you see here um, a speed of sound, which uh, for the blue example, I think there's somewhere here is uh, 0.33, yeah? So, so we have a speed of sound yeah, uh, so we, below the conformal limit. It rises to 0 0.4 uh, and then with appearance of hyperons goes down, maybe reaching uh, 0 0.35 at uh, eight saturation density. So. David, did you want me to comment or, or somebody else? Yeah, I think, I think yeah. uh, that uh, uh, Konstantin uh, asked yeah. But particularly address this example to you. Yeah, okay, great. So because there were yeah, yeah. several speakers with names that sound like Alex, I was completely sure. But, but I mean, this is, so, so the way we do our calculation is, is uh, we have a, we start from, from the speed of sound and, and which we uh, interpolate using piecewise linear uh, parts that, that uh, go up to seven different segments between the low and high densities and and these kind of the, the these are all perfect examples of the kinds of speeds of sound that we have we have 
uh, altogether about half a million uh, EOSs in, in our ensemble and, and we, we really go through every possible uh, sort of natural and, and also many very, very unnatural behaviors. And, and these would be very nice examples that we are looking at right now that would still be consistent with, with uh, sort of matter inside maximally massive neutron stars behaving in the quark matter fashion. So, so of course, this the green and, and brown dotted lines, those are a bit different because th those at very high density still go up to quite high high uh, values of of the speed of some squid. So I'm not quite sure what ha happened. I mean, there should be another phase transition then at some point that would take us down below one, one third, but the, the blue and, and red ones are, are certainly uh, sort of behaviors of the speed of sound that we are seeing all the time, very natural ones. And and also yeah, so, there's maybe uh, one, one last thing that I, I wanted uh -huh. to wanted to em emphasize regarding regarding uh, our work, which is that um, even if the speed of sound reaches higher values than than c squared equals 0.7. And even if there is a strong first order phase transition, even in those cases, we oftentimes do find, actually most of the time, we do find quark matter like uh, matter in, inside maximal mass stars. So, so it, it's only that the few cases where, where matter behaves in a nuclear matter like fashion, th those require both of these, these uh, sort of conditions to be fulfilled. But, but the fulfillment of, of these two conditions doesn't imply that there cannot be quark matter. Uh, uh, thank you. So uh, do I get to try that uh, in relation to uh, your uh, results, we can call quark matter or, uh, or uh, anything which has a low speed of sound, be that... Uh, no. No, not, not okay. quite. Really hyperionized matter or no. something else? Yeah. No, no. So, so our criterion for, for quark matter uh, had actually in the end more to do with the polytropic index gamma. So, so we, uh, what we called mm -hmm. quark matter was, and, and this was really just, I mean, we, we, in order to make quantitative statements about the, the sizes of quark matter cores and so on, we had to have some kind of a simple criterion for for what we call quark matter and what we don't call quark matter. And the speed of sound was not the, the criterion we used, but what we used gamma smaller mm -hmm. than 1.75 uh, all the way up to asymptotically high density. So the idea was that when, when you have a given equation of state, if you plot gamma as a function of density, then uh, when gamma drops at the point when gamma drops below 1.75 and remains below that limit, then all the way to to asymptotically large densities, then we say that this is the point where matter goes mm -hmm. to, to quark matter. Okay. And, yeah, and right? this is certainly not, not the perfect. Something I mean, I, I'm sure that, that uh, uh -huh. I mean, th this was really just, I don't know, an, an indicative criterion. I'm sure that we can come up with better ones. And this is exactly what I'm, because we, we are kind of, in the way that we do the calculation, we lose all microscopic information. Uh, in, in this uh, interpolation mm -hmm. uh, stage in the sense that we, we can track these quantities, but we don't have a, have a sort of uh, microphysical explanation of why things are uh, what they, they are, like what, what is the, the uh, interaction and, and so on. So this is exactly what I wanted to ask you guys who are doing, doing sort of model calculations at these intermediate densities. That how would you define quark mm -hmm. matter in terms of material properties? Thank you very much, Alexi. This was a very good point. Now coming back to the okay, thank interpretation you. and what can be learned for the properties of matter from uh, observations. I see now raised hands in the auditorium. So first of all, I would like to ask uh, uh, Veronica for a question. Hi, I was going to say something very similar um, and um, concerning the plot that was just shown on the screen. Um, showing that when the hyperons appear in a purely hadronic model, the speed of sound can go down and mimic the effect of a first order phase transition to quark matter. Um, I was going to discuss some results that we had uh, using the QMC model, but they're very similar to these ones. But I think what's something important to keep in mind is the 
I still think there's a phase transition involved in this result and the one I was going to refer in, to in the QMC model. The issue is that it's not a first order phase transition. I don't know, looking at this could be a second, third, fourth order, but there's still some sort of phase transition involved. It's just not to quark matter, it's not first order. Mm -hmm. um, let me take the next question. Third order, actually. Hmm? Do you want to reply to this? Uh, it uh, sh should be third order. So this uh, speed of sounds con continues just for Hyperon's case. Speed of sound can continues, but the derivatives are not. Okay, uh, let me take the next question by Michael Bubala. Yeah, hello everybody. Um, I have a simple question to Alexi, which I guess I, I asked him already long ago, but I forgot the outcome. Namely, um, about this, this matching, um, or let's say the interpolation. Uh, so you have the two limits, uh, the, the perturbative limit at the very high mu and, and then the nuclear physics limit at, at very small densities. And if you construct a, let's say, a phenomenological hybrid equation of state, then you usually have something like a back constant, namely uh, taking into account that the perturbative calculation, of course, is based on a perturbative vacuum. And so P equal to zero means really zero in the perturbative vacuum, whereas on the other hand, uh, in the low limit, you have the um, non-trivial QCD vacuum uh, with, yeah, these are the right figures, the non-trivial uh, QCD vacuum um, with, with quark and gluon condensates. And so in principle, zero on the left and zero on the right does not mean necessarily the same. So there, there, there could be a, a constant shift between the two. And my question is, would that affect at all any of, of your results, I mean, obviously at very high chemical potentials, uh, the uh, small constant doesn't matter, but in the intermediate region, maybe it does. Um, so that, that's a, certainly a very good question. So uh, of course, our whole approach uh, relies on the fact that we can model uh, neutron stars through a, a simple equation of state of the form of, of the pressure as a function of, of energy density. And then, like you said, these kinds of questions do become very uh, relevant in exactly at the intermediate densities. But in the way that we are doing the our calculation right now, we are only using the, the PQCD result at 40 saturation densities onwards. And, and then uh, the hadronic equation of state at basically below or around one saturation density. So all these types of, of details are like you were referring to, are hidden in, in the way that we perform the interpolation in yeah, at the intermediate densities. And there we really don't make any non-trivial assumptions. We literally allow all possible behaviors of, of, of P as a function of epsilon, uh, including first order phase transitions that, that uh, correspond to jumps in, in discontinuous jumps in energy density and so on. So I, I don't think that this is that in practice in the way that we, we implement this this interpolation set up this issue that in, in principle is certainly is certainly a, a relevant one could play any any role D does anyone else maybe have an have a comment on this so uh, maybe i wanted to um, inject here so uh, one question to the audience so what do you think about the possible universality of the scale for the transition, like uh, the region uh, we have here for the transition energy density or also the transition pressure. So there are analysis of heavy ion collisions and some claims for uh, more or less universality of the border between hadronic world and uh, quark gluon plasma world, which uh, suggests some pressure around 100 or even a little bit below 100 MeV per Fermi cube. And uh, the, the energy densities of the crossover transition from the lattice is indicated down here. So is this then uh, the region which is also to be expected? So I mean, by, on physical grounds. So is there does somebody in the audience know about a good argument for possible universality of the border between hadronic world and uh, and the quark gluon plasma world? Something like the binding energy of, uh, of hadrons, yeah. What uh, 
makes uh, what defines the end of the of the hadronic matter. I see the name of Rob Pisarski in the in the audience, so it would be interesting to hear his comment on this. Rob, do you want to say something to this question? Uh, sorry, I I'm just giving up. Could you repeat the question? Yes, uh, we were uh, suspecting. Uh, is there some? Uh, could there be? Could you imagine some physics uh, background uh, for a hypothesis of a universal scale in energy densities or pressures for the transition between uh, purely hadronic matter and uh, quark gluon plasma? So we have uh, shown here on this uh, t equals zero equation of state plot pressure versus energy density the scale for the crossover transition in energy density from the lattice QCD. And uh, we see actually here, there is some a little bit broadened region from the present observational constraints. So could there be the transition or should the transition uh, to the QCD phase, should that be at higher energy densities? So is there a physics a possible physics background for a hypothesis like universality of the transition? No, I, I, I think that the transition at zero T and non-zero mu will be very different from that at zero mu and finite T. In the character, yeah. yes, this is probably undoubted, yeah? But uh, the scale of uh, the energy density, because that should be- Oh, specifically for the energy dense, I don't know. Mm -hmm. For the energy density. Or the pressure, which is the thermodynamical potential in the end, yeah? So is there a kind of uh, universal scale which would mark the limit uh, of the hadronic world? David, maybe maybe I can make a comment on that. Yeah, please, of course, yes. Sure. Yeah, yeah. We were wondering actually about the scale for the phase transition at zero chemical potential when one goes to the chiral limit. So when you go to the chiral limit, the transition temperature drops, of course, quite a bit from 150 to 130 MeV. And when you just calculate the energy density, that is actually a pretty small energy density. So it's clearly not the energy density where that stays constant, but what one finds is that roughly the density of pions stays constant when you go from physical quark masses to uh, vanishing quark masses, which gave me the impression that uh, something like a percolation transition of hadrons uh, is a reasonable picture for the transition. Okay. Yeah, or could it be the pressure, which uh, so is there, do, do you have a guess um, of a quantity which could be uh, compared on the mu equal zero temperature axis or T equal zero mu axis? Yeah? So uh, for, ha for having, uh, defining the transition. Okay, the hint to the chiral limit is probably good, but um, okay. Any further comments to this? Okay, there was a question in the audience by um, Kirill, Kirill Bugayev. Yes, thank you. Uh, David, I would like to return to the phase diagram and to discuss this uh, picture in larger scale, which you showed that there might be no, uh, or there might be the second uh, critical endpoint with lower temperature and so on. Maybe we better yeah. call it triple yeah. point or, or yeah. so on. So the, my question to the audience is, uh, 
the simple one or two simple questions. Um, in heavy ion collisions as I wrote, uh, we have indirect uh, evidence uh, that there might be two phase transitions. First, at lower collision energies, the partial symmetry restoration happens in hadronic case, and then at higher collision energies, the deconfinement happens, maybe. A uh, question about this uh, partial symmetry restoration phase in, of hadrons. Is it ruled out in astrophysics? This is the first question. And if it is ruled out, then uh, do you have any estimates for the lower SEP critical endpoint temperature or not? Thank you very much. Uh, maybe I can uh, refer to this. Uh, this was the phase diagram for the um, chiral restoration transition in the hadronic phase. So the deconfinement phase is here, this black dash dot line. You so, cannot see uh, anything? No? No? No, we cannot. I, I cannot not see anything. Uh, okay. I, sh I, I thought I'm, I'm sharing the screen. Yes, but it's all black. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I, I recall then this. Let, okay, then let me, okay, let me try something. Uh, it started again, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Stop sharing, I start again, okay. Sorry for that. And, yes, exactly. And let's see, okay, right, wait, wait. Yeah. Here it is. So uh, now I make the full screen, okay. So maybe in the meantime, I'll just provide a very brief answer to, to this question. If it was in context of our calculations. Yeah, yeah. We explicitly assumed the presence of only one first order phase transition. And, and this, there was no uh, deep physical insight that, that went to this assumption that we, we wrote down in, in the paper, but it was mainly just for simplicity of analysis. I mean, if you allow for two, uh, first order phase transitions, then things get a lot more complicated. So we don't have a physical reasoning why this could not take place, but we have not considered it. Okay, thank you. At least I understood uh, uh, what is going on. Thanks. Okay, so here uh, we have uh, for this same... Maybe we have again the same problem that okay. we see black only. You, you see black only. Okay, then let me just For a moment, we saw something, at least I saw something else. But... Yes, me too. Remy, try not the full screen mode, probably. Yeah, yeah, I will try not the full screen mode. Okay, so let me see um, where, where I am now. Okay, so. Um... Sorry for that. Okay, okay. It's, it's this direction. Here. Yes. Okay. And uh, so here we have, um, so there's some parameters I will not explain now. So different versions with a rather low critical endpoint here uh, of the same order of the liquid gas uh, critical endpoint. So here is actually the liquid gas transition in that model. and. Uh, we, this would translate to a transition in the mass radius plot here uh, around the two solar mass uh, region. So this so is a flattening of the mass radius curves here, which mark the transition to chiral symmetric um, hadronic matter. So there's no deconfinement yet here in this model. So it, which points out that there is really some, some uh, some point with the interpretation, yeah. But we see that these are rather stiff models, uh, so they are, um, yeah, exceeding thirteen kilometers radius at the high masses. Otherwise, they fulfill the constraints. Two solar mass and the constraint from the tidal deformability is also uh, uh, fulfilled. From by the, from the okay, model. thank you, David. But one more remark. Uh, maybe the phase diagram we are studying is much more complicated. Uh, you can check some recent papers by Frankfurt Group 
and you can find that they discussing the condensation of alpha particles in, in nuclear matter. And I would go one step further and assume that uh, probably there might be several uh, go as down as one MeV for, uh, yeah, yeah. The, the, and this can, can be the other phase transition, like condensation of alpha particles or some heavier particles, you know? So but I would say that we, we should think in the future about more complicated phase diagram and how to study it using not only nuclear physics, but also your setup, which is uh, on my taste, very, very uh, helpful. And I would say probably in some respects, you're doing much better job than we do in heavy ion collisions. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the comment. Uh, let me comment on the alpha particles. So the alpha particles are rather extended clusters and uh, there have been many studies of the stability of light nuclear clusters when we increase the density. And uh, what these studies have shown is that there is uh, the more transition for the clusters or so dissociation of the clusters in the liquid gas uh, instability region. So no survival of uh, light clusters in the liquid phase, so in the uh, supersaturation nuclear matter. But um, of course, some co in the sense of some correlations, it's always possible correlations in the continuum. But in how far this then influences on the phase diagram is a different uh, question. Okay, uh, so how do we have uh, further questions? So uh, there was a question in the audience from uh, Alexander Ayrian. Is he there? Okay, maybe not. Hello? Yeah, hello. Uh, I'm here, yeah. yeah so please. I had just a question to Kostya. Uh, he showed the mass radius diagram and I just found that Grain lines uh, looked very exotic, and my question was to Costa to explain that uh, gray lines. And that's it. Uh, which precisely gray lines in my talk or gray lines on that uh, screen? Yeah, during this discussion, you showed. Yeah, 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 I did. So uh, these are some con constraints which I actually can remind now so they're not so often discussed in the works but uh, they are the same as in the the clan's work of uh, Thomas Klen and everybody on the constraints so uh, these are just the same constraints on the MR diagram you can find them there no no I'm talking about uh, the curve of the, the sequence of, of compact stars. Okay, uh, I have closed everything already, so uh, let me find it again, no problem. Um. So, 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 so. So maybe while you are uh, looking, um, I can uh, uh, read the question to the audience. The question was about the possibility of so where exactly is the mass limit um, between 
neutron stars and uh, black holes and uh, the question so that um, there are no uh, observations of uh, stars of, uh, about uh, the mass of the merger of GW170817 around. So um, the claim that we should have seen such very massive neutron stars if this would be a typical um, uh, event. Uh, because I raised in the discussion, um, I, I reminded some recent work where there were some claims that uh, in the remnant of the neutron binary neutron star merger, GW170817, there could be a leftover pulsar still present at that uh, mass. Yeah, so David, uh, uh, I have a question here in respect to this. Um, uh, but how would you then describe the gamma ray burst? Excuse me? Yeah, yeah I, 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 I hear your question. So. Yeah. So, so we saw the gamma ray burst and, um, um, well, I think the only explanation real until now is that it was created um, after the, the hypermassive neutron star uh, collapsed to a black hole, the material was falling in and created the gamma burst but if there is a long lived remnant how would you explain then the um, gamma ray burst which we saw uh, two seconds okay. uh, after there are gamma ray bursts uh, associated with supernova explosions and um, so there are also models which um, have, um, have mechanisms of gamma ray burst uh, creation with an intact uh, Ah, excuse me, this I did not know. Yeah. Ah, okay, so so there are um, there are supernova explosions observed with a remnant, Basically, and you have also yeah. saw yeah. the gamma ray burst. Yes, mm -hmm. so some but you saw also a, 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 a pulsar there. Yeah. Uh, no, this this with the pulsar is I can send you. I I have not at hand now this. Uh, Recent, um, this was recently in the science news. Um, the long term, after a thousand days, observation of the uh, remnant of GW170817 showed that the X ray um, luminosity uh, did not fall off as quickly as was expected if it was a black hole, but rather would be consistent with some oh, okay. engine. Um, mm -hmm. In the center could be a pulse. So, in respect to, to the mass gap, I wanted to, to say something which I forgot. Could you please go, go off in the sharing models because I want to share something? Thank you. Um, so, um, it was about um, uh, if we saw here a black hole, black hole merger or a neutron star black hole merger. The, the observed mass of this little thing here uh, was 2.6 solar mass. I know that, that there are papers which um, that give, um, somebody is typing something. Um, yeah, okay. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Um, okay, uh, so, um, and I said to, to explain such a high, um, high mass, uh, probably dark matter could be important, but I forgot uh, to mention uh, that um, there, because I found it difficult to construct such a high mass, um, such a high mass uh, when you have a phase transition and to go over to, to 2.6 solar mass, uh, but I want to show you um, the uh, following thing here, um, which is in this article by Drago. The important thing uh, is there that they um, have here constructed a, um, uh, the, the transition is not like we do the tra transition, it imposed a, a strange matter hypothesis and as a result, you do have in principle two different um, equation of states, the pure strange quark matter equation of state and the hadronic matter equation of state. And in their model, uh, uh, this pure strange quark 
uh, star uh, could have such a high mass. So I found it interesting and I see uh, this as uh, one other possibility um, uh, to have such a high mass uh, neutron star. Uh, okay, this is just what I wanted to mention here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, good, just a short uh, comment mm. to this. So we have uh, calculated an example with my student of a constant speed of sound quark matter model who is actually not even reaching the, the speed of light, uh, but uh, 80%, for the, so 0 0.8 for CS squared and a stiff Hadronic equation of state. Then we have twins and a maximum mass of 0.6. Possible. Okay, is is the uh, uh, is the highest mass in the second branch or in in, in the first branch? If if you count with first and second, it's in the second. Uh, it's in the second very early, very early onset, uh, uh, well below one solar mass. Okay? Uh, so you can then describe um, it also with such a, a twin star hybrid oh, equation. Exactly. Thing. I, uh, okay. Is, uh, I, I found it difficult to 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 get that. Yes, you have to turn. Know that, uh, mm -hmm. Christian and Schaffner Bielig also found it difficult. They even recently put a paper on archive where they say it's impossible. Uh, but, yes, I also found it, but it depends on the hydronic equation of yes. it. I would say yes. Yeah, and probably you have taken uh, such a good hydronic equation of state that that you do not need to increase. Uh, the sound speed of the pure quark phase to 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 over one to get this. Um, as, yeah. as I have, uh, uh, if I have some mechanism mm -hmm. which makes nuclear matter very stiff above uh, saturation, uh, then I can have an early onset. Uh, okay, I have to look at that. Okay, good. Uh, uh, Kostya wanted to share something with us. Uh, well, I basically answered Sasha's question in private, so it was uh, more convenient you, for you us. You don't I want think. to share. Okay, good. So, but maybe it would be nice to, to hear the answer. Or, or... These are where the uh, lines of the boundary of the most probable uh, regions for MR uh, from uh, works of. Uh, Latima. Okay. Yeah. So. So oh, we um, uh, are, are there more questions or uh, comments, urgent um, issues uh, from the audience or also from our speakers of this session? Otherwise, I would say. We have already discussed now over one hour, and there is this old saying that one can discuss over everything, but not over one hour. 